But right now we're going to transition, we're going to continue in our series of the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, actually, it's the seven letters that Jesus Christ sent to these churches. And as we go through the series, what we understand is Jesus Christ is giving a message to John the Apostle and saying, I have a specific message for these seven churches. And we see what they're doing right, and we see what they're doing wrong. And by standing on the sidelines and watching Jesus' interaction with these very real congregations, we can learn as well. A lot of times we see ourselves in, in portion in these different churches, both on what is being commended and what is needs to be, be encouraged or rebuked or challenged. And so as we look at these churches, I hope we do um, not just think, oh yeah, those people in Pergamum, those people in Ephesus need to get it together, but I hope that we take these words, which are just as powerful and appropriate for us as we examine our own hearts, as we examine our own churches, as we consider where God is leading us. I did tell you that some people believe these are also, a, um, have some prophetic significance to different um, churches of historical eras, and while we can't be dogmatic on that, for those who, who hold to that view would say the church last week, Thyatira, and today what we're moving on to Sardis, these are generally associated with the historical churches of the medieval time period, uh, the papacy into the established churches, which were spiritually dead but dominated nations. And we, as you look through church history, and, and it's not, not just in the Catholic Church, but a lot of state churches that arose and had their powers tied to princes and earthly authorities, they were powerful in name, but they were lacking in deeds and purity. And that's, that's why um, some people say today, why, why are there so many denominations? Well, well, not any denomination has an exclusivity on truth because the truth comes from, from the word of God, which his Bible is available to all people who would read it. And salvation alone is in Jesus Christ. It's not through a Baptist church or an Episcopalian church. It's not through an Assemblies of God church or any other denominational title you can put there. It's through Jesus Christ. Um, but a lot of these, these different movements sprung up as people considering the rebuke of God and saying we need to return to Jesus Christ and we need to return to a pure and faithful walk to who he is. And if, if we don't have it here, then we need to take responsibility for our own actions. And so I hope we, I hope we consider these things. Today we're going to look at Sardis, um, a church that was, had a good reputation. But the reputation didn't meet the reality. Don't you hate that in life when you have an expectation based on something's reputation and it just doesn't match? Somebody recommends a restaurant to you, said this is the greatest place to go. And you go there and you're like, meh, just the, the expectations were too high and you're, it's not as good, as good as you expected. Of course, sometimes it's even worse. It's something you expect to be good and maybe it's a meal you've had hundreds of times and it's served before you and someone got something right, wrong with the recipe. There's always a danger if you invite your children to help you in the cooking. Like, so how much salt did you put in the chocolate chip cookies? Because no one really likes that much salt in the chocolate chip cookies. And I, and I know we've had this experience over time. You said, it looks good on the outside, but when you go to take a bite of it, something is lacking, something is wrong. In the very worst cases of such a scenario, you may even eat the meal, it may taste good, you may be happy, and then you go home and find out you have food poisoning. Something that looked good on the outside was toxic and deteriorating and harmful. And so we're gonna look at, at this church in the city of Sardis, and there's some really interesting parallels about the city of Sardis and the church which later on would be in Sardis. Like all the other cities, it's here in Asia Minor. It's one of the largest and most influential historical cities in that part of the world. It was a capital of Lydia at one time. It was a, a very important city, not biblically, um, although it is mentioned in the Bible, but in that historical civilization. Today it's abandoned, there's only a small village nearby, so when we show the pictures up there, that is what was once the great city of Sardis. It had a lot of idolatry there, um, notably to the mother goddess Sibel, and had some really debasing practices of worship, um, things that we would say are very sensuous and debauchery and, and idolatry, it was, it was all there. Um, but if we look at the city here, it was lo located in this Hermas Valley. Its location was on a hill. And here's the really interesting part. Um, where the fortress was for the city was on a hill with sheer cliffs. It had 1,500 foot nearly perpendicular walls on three sides because of the cliffs of the valley. And it could only be approached from a very steep incline. 
and it caused the people to be confident. It was very secure in terms of defense. That's why it grew to be so prominent. But it also caused the people within that city to become overconfident, to become complacent, and to become lazy. And on more than one account, they were conquered the same way. They were so overconfident because of their mighty walls that they didn't even put guards on the walls. And so in the dark of the night, people would scale the walls, scale these cliffs with ropes, and crept into the city and took it while it was sleeping. Their overconfidence and complacency led to defeat. We're going to see that's a theme that's going to be repeated now to the church at Sardis centuries later. Because there are character deficiencies at the church. There was no indication of persecution or trouble from outside forces. Uh, there is apparently no heresy within, but things seem to be peaceful and religiously correct. One, one um, commentator says, it was a church that was perhaps too good to be true. Its religiously proper appearance may have meant that it had, only, it had fully and silently compromised with the truth and the pagan society around it. The perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. They were a church that was living like they were at peace, but silently, silently they had surrendered their identity and their effectiveness. So let's read this together. Here we are in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, starting in verse 1, and we're going to go through verse 6. We read as Jesus speaks, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy." He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Let's pray, and then we'll continue in our examination of these verses this morning. Lord, thank you so much as we have the opportunity to look at the words that you have for this church, and I pray that your words would um, continue to resonate with us and your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts to give us encouragement or conviction. And I pray truly that you would be our teacher this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see here um, in the village of Sardis, this, this valley, this protected valley, there is a church that is struggling. And Jesus is giving a message to the church, and as he speaks, he speaks as one with authority. It is the master of the church who is speaking. We see what he says. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now you may look at that and say, that's a really interesting verse. What are the seven spirits of God? And we'd say this, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. That Jesus Christ, who has sent the Holy Spirit, probably to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, and the work of the Holy Spirit here. This is, there, there's some other opinions on this, but this is a very sound one. 11.2 in the book of Isaiah says, The Lord's Spirit will rest on him, a spirit that gives extraordinary wisdom, a spirit that provides the ability to execute plans, a spirit that produces absolute loyalty to the Lord. He will take delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by mere appearance or make decisions on the basis of hearsay. He will treat the poor fairly and make right decisions for the downtrodden of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod, rod of his mouth and order the wicked to be executed. Justice will be like a belt around his waist. Integrity will be like a belt around his hips. See, what he says here is the Lord speaks out these seven truths. The spirit of the God who rests upon the nation of Israel. And when he spoke this, he says, these are the things that you should be doing. Because these are the proper fruit of the Holy Spirit working in your nation. And now we see here that he, Jesus Christ, has the power and the Holy Spirit indwelling his people should have the effect of having real results and real fruit. But this is a, a tree 
that looks large and its leaves look grand, but it's a fruit tree that produces no fruit. Saying, there should be fruit. They need to understand that Jesus has the authority over the church, and the church he is speaking to needs revitalization. He needs the empowering influence of the Holy Spirit in their congregation, and it's really obvious because a church has no commendation. Out of all the churches we read about, there's nothing good spoken about the church in Sardis. It's a really, it's a sad letter. Well, and I, and I guess you could hedge on that because they do have a good reputation. And, and normally that would be a good thing, right? It is good to have an effective witness. It is good to have a good name. And when you look for people that you call into leadership in the church, if you go to the epistle to Timothy and the epistle to Titus, you want somebody who has a good reputation with outsiders of those outside the church. Somebody who represents himself well according to the character of God. But the, the problem here is that the church his reputation is lasting beyond the reality of the situation. He's saying, yeah, I still have a good reputation. And I don't know whether that's in the community or to the other churches in the surrounding communities. They think you're doing great things, but the truth of the matter is the emperor has no clothes. You are producing no fruit. You need a renewal. You need the Holy Spirit to descend again to revitalize your walk with Jesus Christ and to produce evidence of the relationship that you have. And like I said, this is a sad letter that we can go so quickly and there is no commendation. We all know about this, right? Places you grew up going to that you go back when you're older and it's just not as good. Once again, let's stay with the food theme because we all relate to food. Every one of us has a favorite meal or a favorite restaurant. And there's a restaurant maybe you went to as a kid all the time and the food was great and you were excited and then you get older and you want to bring somebody to this restaurant usually one of those more localized places so you've got to come with me because you've never been here and I want to take you to this restaurant and you go and you're like what a letdown what happened did they change ownership did something happen it's not as good as I remembered it the reputation is no longer valid we 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 know about actors or athletes who formerly excelled and were at the top of their craft but they reach a point in their career where now they seem to just mail it in and only be doing their job for a paycheck. They don't seem to play with the intensity. They don't seem to care about their craft anymore. And all of you have been excited to go see someone perform or play and said, I don't think their heart's in it anymore. There's no fire. That was a waste of my time. That was a waste of my money. And such things happen in life, but in the church, we don't need to have deteriorating skills and impact because here's, here's the reality of the situation. It's not dependent on us. And that's why it's really important that, that Jesus is talking about the seven spirits of God and who is the authority over the church. Who provides life and the ability to impact the community but Christ himself. We are Christ's representatives. He is not dependent on us, but we need to be dependent on him and attentive and worshipful and engaged. Because our effectiveness is from God and the work of the Holy Spirit through us. And, I, and as I was reading through this, I remembered again the words which many of you know so well from Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 28, which says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And even to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is a church that needs not to look at its own reputation, not to look at its past deeds, but to fix their gaze once again to Jesus Christ and say, fall on us with power and work through us and draw people to yourself as we represent you before our community, as we live before you honorably and faithfully. But that's not the case yet. They're a beautiful building, perhaps on the outside, but inside it's empty and it's dead and they're sleeping. We read, Jesus says, verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die 
For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. They're told to strengthen what remains. And isn't that just a sad truth about life, that if we do not stay engaged, things atrophy, right? They weaken, they deteriorate. And I've said many times before, I was in great shape my senior year in high school. But I can't say, you know what, I used to work out all the time, so I'm just going to go for a long run today. It doesn't work that way. You can't take decades off and expect to be in the same shape you were when you were 17. You can't take three months off and try to be in the same shape you were, right? I mean, and don't you just hate that about life? How you can train, you can discipline yourself, you can work hard, and then you take the winter off, as I usually do around here, and spring comes, and I, I, I just dread spring. Because for me, as has been my history in the 10 years I've lived here, I have barely worked out any winter, which means the spring is very, very painful to get back into shape. That and the dandelions that spring up every fall, I mean every spring in my lawn, just means the spring is a time of labor. But it doesn't need to be that way. If I would be disciplined, if I would be engaged, then I could maintain a level of accomplishment. The same things are true spiritually. You can't take years, decades off and expect to pick up in the same place that you left off. There's a deterioration. It's like watering a plant. You forget to water a plant for a month, it's probably not alive, correct? And I remember I've done this on more than one occasion. Occasionally, Lori would go with, with the children and she'd go to Southern California to visit her parents and I'd be here working because she would have the summers off and I would still be here during the summers with the rest of you who weren't on vacation. And then I remember about a weekend, I was supposed to water that plant. And you just go over and it looks really, really sick and really, really sad. And you, you, you're, you're offering up a prayer, not so much for the plant, but then my wife will not be mad that I killed her plant. <laughs> but, but vicariously, I'm like, dear Lord, please protect this plant, which translated means, dear Lord, please save me from my own stupidity. And so you try to water the plant and bring it back to life. And, and actually, we do have a plant that lived in the corner of our kitchen for years. We don't know how that thing lived, by grace, apparently. But it, it lived and it blossomed and it grew. But we have to take care of it. You have to nurture it. You have to give it the sustenance so that it has life. And we act foolishly when we treat our spiritual life like it's something different. Like we don't have to nourish it. Like we don't have to walk correctly. We don't have to spend time with God's word and his people. And we expect to thrive. And I don't know when the church here forgot. I don't know what happened. There's some absence here on all the things they're doing wrong. But the pronouncement that you are dead is pretty telling. There are no signs of life spiritually. Somewhere along the way, they forgot to follow the Savior. They forgot to feed themselves. And they are not healthy. And the worst part is, they don't even know it. They don't even know it. In the same way, Jesus Christ calls himself the vine and he calls us the branches. And when we stop drinking from the vine, we stop producing fruit and we wither. We need to stay focused on Jesus. But the great part about this is where I can't always bring a plant back to life, sometimes this is beyond saving, that God can revive the flailing believer who turns back to him and give him healing and give him refreshment and he can restore them to where they were before. This is not just a pronouncement of judgment, but as you read in here, even he says, you're dead, but... Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. There is still time in that call to repentance to change and to newness and effectiveness. But they do need to stop resting on their laurels and sardis, stop living off their reputation. They need to realize that they're in a battle which is still raging. See, here's, here's a problem at sardis, perhaps. Apparently, when we're not mentioning persecution, they looked around them and said, we're at peace, we have won, we can now stop. It's a very real challenge to all of us today that we can forget to be vigilant. And when you forget to be vigilant, what happens is we slowly, oftentimes without even realizing it, give up ground to sin. Because we can't stop moving. That's not the way the world works. The world is against the things of God. In fact, Jesus Christ himself said for this time period, he called Satan the Lord of this world. 
It's not that Jesus Christ is not above it, but who has the predominant sway and influence on the hearts of sinful men? But it is the devil. It is a corrupt system. It is our own hearts which lead us into error. And if we stop moving forward, we will go backwards. It's like swimming against the current. Sometimes it's like being on a treadmill. You, you notice when you're on a treadmill, right? If you just stop moving, you shoot off the back. Even if you're going slowly, it doesn't take you very long to go that 60 inches if you have a long one. And you're on the floor saying, oh, I guess I've got to keep walking in order to keep moving forward. It's very obvious when there's opposition in your life, when society is very opposed to you, that you as a believer are called to live differently. But what's dangerous is there are times when the world is not oppositional, at least belligerent. But it is polite and seductive, and it lulls us into complacency. And we don't realize that we are slowly drifting into error, and we are slowly succumbing to ineffectiveness. And we don't realize how far we have fallen because we've fallen so slowly. But we, we need to keep our eyes on Christ Jesus and to be passionate about serving him. Jesus says, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. He says, you've lost the plot. Church at Sardis, you've lost it. You've forgotten your purpose. You've forgotten your Lord. Remember what Christ has saved you from. It's one of the biggest lies of, the, of society today is you're okay and I'm okay, so we're okay. And even the way we present the gospel sometimes is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which, by the way, is true. It's just not the whole story. God does love you, and he does have a wonderful plan for your life, and it's important to know that God is for you and not against you, but it is vitally important that we realize what we have been saved from, which was our own sins and trespasses, and that we were guilty before God, deserving of judgment, headed for hell, and Jesus Christ, by his own blood, by his own sacrifice, because of his own love, said, I will die for you. He paid the price. We need to remember what Christ has saved us from and how much he loves us. And we can't let our complacency come in and turn the passion for the bridegroom into a loveless marriage. But instead, remember his passionate pursuit of you, his steadfast love and return to him. We're talking about Sardis, but I know sometimes in my own life, sometimes in our own life, in a world that will lull us to slumber, we can repeat these same errors. We've all seen it, maybe in our own hearts, maybe in a friend who used to hold close and say, I remember when they were so excited about Jesus. But today, if I was to judge them from the outside, I'd wonder if they ever had a faith. How do these things happen? They don't happen usually in a snap moment. They come by falling asleep. But there's a challenge. First, the challenge is a negative challenge. And we see that Jesus says, Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, it uh, certainly reflects back to the city. The people would know the history of their city. Remember, we didn't have guards, and we didn't know the day we were going to get conquered. But it happened because we didn't pay any attention. There was, there was a sign this is way back when Jay Leno was still on The Tonight Show. He used to do those headline news. Yeah, some of you remember that. And say, wanted information leading to the arrest of the person who robs, and was at a, a do-it-yourself uh, car wash, who is robbing the machine every other Tuesday between 11 and 1 in the morning. I think this guy should not be hard to catch, should he? If you know every other Tuesday you are being robbed between this two-hour period, don't you think they'd be pretty easy to catch? I was just thinking of the stupidity of the person who put up the sign. Because you're basically saying, um, we know when you're robbing you, and so we're going to put up the sign so you don't get caught. Right? Because if, if the thief says, hey, you know what? Tomorrow night at 3 a.m., I'm going to break in your house, and I'm going to steal all your silverware. Now, I know some of you be like, really? That's what you're taking, my silverware? If you need it that badly, how about I'll just package you up and leave it on the front porch for you because it's not that special. I got it at Target in one of those boxes. It's not like in the old days when silverware was made of silver. But if I said that, I said, I'm going to come in and I'm going to break in at night and I'm going to steal your silverware, you'd be ready for me. 
No, I'm, I'm not going to Hinkle's house. That, that's like an, an armory, all right? And I'm sure he'd be prepared. And I'm not going to some of your other houses because you're bigger than me and you're scary. And I'm not going to Witterberg's house because he'd let me in, but he'd put a mouse trap in there. So I'd reach in, he'd be like, video. I, I don't know what'd be going on. But you would know it was coming. You could prevent it. But he says, you won't know because you're not being watchful. You don't realize, you don't realize that you're under attack. You won't even see it coming. Here's the good news. Verse 4, you have a few names, even in Sardis. And this tells you how bad it is. You have a few names, even in Sardis. Even in your wretched, pitiful, horrible condition. And Jesus Christ is saying, that's how bad it is. But even there, there's a remnant who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. This gives a reference to the throne room in heaven, and we'll go on, and you see this imagery as we read forward. But it's also very unique to this town here. As part of their pagan, idolatrous, and um, horrible worship, to approach the temple of Sibel, you had to be dressed in, all in white. You had to be clothed in pure garments. And Jesus, on the other hand, is saying, you will be dressed in white by me, and you will be welcome. You will not be turned away. I know who are mine. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. You will be professed before the audience of heaven as true and faithful followers of Jesus. You will be recognized for standing tall and standing firm and walking faithfully. There is a reward to walking with Jesus. And I've told you many times before that sometimes we, we don't talk about that. Because if you're like me, you think the very fact that Jesus Christ died for me feels like enough. It does. Because I know I deserve none of it. So the fact that he would save me at all, I am so far on the plus side of the ledger, why should I even consider that God would want to give me more? But he does want to give us more. We serve a good God, a loving God, who calls us his children and wants to honor us as his children and bless us and lavish his affections on us. And he wants to acknowledge when we do something right. There is, there is something to be gained. And he's telling the people, you've forgotten already what you've been saved from, but as if that weren't enough, look what I want to do for you. Return. Return to me. Well, what about us? Uh, obviously, we have a lot of the same, same pulls, a lot of the same complacency just to fall to forget and we have to ask are we can, are we engaged still in a living and healthy and vital walk with jesus christ are we desiring to serve him or are we content to sit in slumber sometimes i'd rather sleep i'm sure you would too sometimes we don't see the immediate payoff and go it's just not worth it, it doesn't feel worth it because payday isn't on Friday. And sometimes you don't see the results of your efforts. And sometimes we get so hung up on the results of our efforts that we don't stop to realize that our labor truly should be for the Lord anyway and not on the results that we see. But in addition to that, sometimes in our society we think of, a, of ministry as an achievement like you make rank. Like you said, hey, I made a rank, so I've arrived, now I can stop. Right? Kind of like, I made retirement, I made this position, I made this class, I made this designation of authority, now I can relax. That's how we tend to think in, our, in our, our society, but it's not a rank, it's rather the opportunity that God continues to give us to be used by his purposes. And that's a huge privilege. I know it doesn't always feel that way when your pastor or someone else in the church feels like they're guilting you into something, but that's not what I'm trying to do. What I want you to understand is that God placed you in your opportunity on purpose so that you can bring glory to him. And your, what you are called to do may change. What you are able to do may change. But every day is in a chance to live for him, this amazing privilege. Seasons of life will dictate sometimes the nature of our service. If you have small children, maybe you can't be involved in the, in the scope of participation that you had previously. That's understandable, but it doesn't mean you can't be used by God. Maybe your primary role at this time is to teach your own children. 
about how to walk with God and to demonstrate faithful service. And when you bring them to church, to bring them with you, so if, even if you just signed up for something which you regard as very menial and very meaningless, such as cleaning a sanctuary, you can bring your kids and model for them how to serve the Lord with gladness. See, what you do may change. Some of you have said, you know what, I'm getting older and I don't have the same vitality and stamina that I had before. And maybe you can't do the same role. But the question is, is do your heart still have the affection to seek to honor Christ? And, and do you stop to ask God, how then, being given what my life circumstances are, being given what my gifts are, do you want me to be used? It changes. There have been times that I've been a pastor, like these last decades. And before that, when I came here, there's times I went back to school. And I was just a normal person like you, sitting in the back, coming in five minutes late to church every Sunday because I didn't have my wife to keep me on track at that time. <laughs> but regardless, whether I had a title, whether I had an official role, I know what, what I need to have because also, also looking ahead to my future is my heart saying, how can I honor you? How can I live rightly? What impact have you given me to have on this world that needs to know you? Do we ask, how do you want to use me today? How can I continue to grow in my relationship with you? Or, like is too many times the error, do we say, God, I'm busy today. I don't have time for you today. We don't say it that, that, that overtly usually. You know what? As a matter of fact, come see me next spring. I'm busy till then. This world, this life's a gift. But you guys know this world is not everything that it promises. It lets you down. It hurts you. It will break your heart. But what God promises is forever. And he is good. And when I said it was not the complete part of the story, but when God loves you and does have a wonderful plan for your life, that is true. And the, minute, the opportunity to serve is part of that wonderful plan. I was thinking about this a lot this week and then just as, as God often does. We had a passage which seemed very much to be a parallel passage in uh, my devotions with my children. And it's in Luke chapter 12. And Jesus is talking about returning to this world. That's something we long for. It's okay. It's okay to be tired of this world, by the way. And there's gonna be days, if not years, where you're saying, so it's not a good day for you to come back? We know that. <laughs> um, but as, as, as it time passes on, Jesus addresses the fact, and whether it's his ultimate coming or whether it's coming in our personal lives as our lives draw to a close, we realize that sometimes you grow weary and you just want to mail it in and you just want to quit and you want to pass the torch off to someone else and say, it's your turn, I'm done. But Jesus is, is speaking about that we need to be vigilant and involved for as long as we have breath. And we read in Luke chapter 12, he says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, burning. That's be watchful, be vigilant. Just the same call we were given to Sardis. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. And when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and he will sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Let's pause right there. Do you, do you see this picture? Here are the servants. The master is coming back from this grand wedding feast, and they know they're supposed to be waiting for him to come back. And it says, when they see him coming, because they're watchful, they open the doors, and instead of him saying, good job, and going to bed, he takes the opportunity to sit and to serve them back. To basically say, well done. Now I want to do for you what you are willing to do for me. However, verse 38, if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. See, there's too much at stake to fall asleep on the job. I guess some jobs you could go to sleep on, no one would notice. Um, preferably not your pilot if you're in a plane, right? Taxi driver, no, maybe not. You don't want that guy sleeping when he's driving. 
But we have been given the opportunity to present the Lord Jesus Christ to a world who needs to know him. We've also been given the opportunity to live faithfully for him, to bring honor to his name, and to bring rewards for ourselves in heaven, and to be involved in something that really matters for his glory. I hope that Sardis is a warning of what can happen if we lose sight of the prize, of what can happen if we forget the love of our Lord and Savior and how much he loves you. And if we fall into a sleep where we have no impact and might as well be dead. Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And so this warning, even though it is a, a rebuke of Sardis, is a caution for us as well, that we may see the error of another congregation and choose another path for ourselves, that we may, in contrast here, well done. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you can use even the failings of our brothers and sisters to be an encouragement to us today that we might not follow in such error. Thank for you for your loving patience that even with the church at Sardis, your rebuke had the hope of repentance and the hope of a return to you and what you could do again. God, I pray that we recognize that anything we do, any accomplishment we have is from your hand and it's only happening because of your own power and your great name. But Lord, we'd like to be a part of that. So I pray that you cause us not to be weary, but you would revitalize our strength, renew our minds, and give us your heart for you and for this world around us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.